welcome back to my youtube channel for new viewers kindly subscribe and click the notification bell so that you can get notified each time i drop a video my name is S.A. Amiibo. I'm talking about comparative anatomy of integumentary system of vertebrates. This is part 2 of the lecture. I'm taking a look at the fish integumentary system. The skin of the fish has the following layers. You have the outer layer of epidermis, the inner layer of the dermis, and deepest layer is the hypodermis. You also have multicellular glands, which you find in some fishes, like the electric organs and then the electric rays. Luminescent glands are also present in deep sea fishes. Mucous glands are all unicellular. You have important modifications of the skin in form of dermal scales that cover the body, and this serves for protection. The skin of the fish is illustrated right here. Very important, we must not forget that you have bony fishes, the cartilaginous fishes and the jawless fishes. The jawless fishes belong to the class Agnita. You, they have osteocoderms and placoderms, which are dermal scales that function as armor. The egg fishes and lampreys, which are jawless fishes, have smooth skin without dermal scales. The epidermis is composed of stacked layer of numerous epidermal cells. The skin of egg fishes are characterized by the presence of thread cells. The dermis is arranged into regular layers of fibrous connective tissue. You have the cells tying themselves in a knot in a way that cleans off mucus from the bodies of the fish. The hypodermis of the fish consists of adipose tissue. Taking a look at the jawless fishes, they have relatively thick skin. Then as you can see in the illustration here, the lamprey and the egg fish, they are both jawless fishes. You have several types of epidermal glandular cells which secrete the protective cuticle that covers the skin of the jawless fishes. You also have multicellular slime glands which secrete large amount of mucus to cover the body surface and this serves for protection. Now talking about the skin of bony fishes. The dermis is subdivided into a superficial layer of loose connective tissue and a deep layer of dense fibrous connective tissue. There are chromatophores which occur within the dermis. You have dermal scales on the skin of bony fishes which do not actually pierce the epidermis. So the bony fishes are illustrated here with the brown bull head and the bull fish. Now taking a look at the skin of cartilaginous fishes, you can see the cookie cutter shark here and the manta ray. Both of them are cartilaginous fishes. The skin is multi-layered and contains mucus and sensory cells. The, that's the epidermis. The dermis contains bones in the form of placoid scales called denticles. The denticles contain blood vessels and nerves and is very similar to vertebrate teeth. There are glands also present. You have club cells which are elongated by nucleated cells and these secrete mucus. There are also granular cells. The granular cells secrete mucus in the skin of lampreys and other fishes. Goblet cells are also present with their narrow base and wide apical ends. And of course, they secrete mucus in chondrocytites and osteocytites. Sarcoform cells are also present. These secrete large membrane bound toxic products to repel enemies. A good look at the skin of the birds reveals that the birds possess thin skin that is loosely attached to the body and this allows for free movement of the wings during flight. The birds have feathers and the feathers are very good and characteristic modifications of the skin of the bird. The feathers not only cover the entire body but they are very useful as far as flight is concerned. The skin of the bird has three layers. You have the epidermis which is the outmost layer Deep to the epidermis, you have the dermis, 
The deepest of the layers is the hypodermis. Taking a look at the beds, the integument or skin of the beds is like that of other vertebrates. It's composed of stratified epidermis and dermis. But the skin is thin and loosely attached to achieve maximum freedom of movement for flight. You have modifications of the stratum conium. Other than the feathers, you also have horny sheets of the beaks. Scales are restricted to the lower legs, feet, webs, and base of beaks. The birds also have claws, which are usually present on the toes. The claws may also occur on one or two fingers, like you can see in the ostrich and the geese. Like the beaks, claws are also diversified and adapted to different habitats. The rest of the body of the bird is covered with feathers. It shows that the feathers evolved from epidermal scales. The feathers protect and insulate the body. Feathers are shed and replaced seasonally. Three usual types of feathers are the contour feathers, the down feathers, and the phylloplums. Contour feathers give the bird their fine round shape. The down feathers are there just at the inferior aspect, and the phylloplums are the hair like feathers. Now you also have glands. The birds do not possess sweat glands. The uropigial glands secrete an oil, that's the print oil. The bird will usually transfer the print oil to its body during printing by rubbing its beak. So when you see the bird rubbing the beak at the base of the tail, it's stimulating the uropigial gland to release the print oil and this print oil is transferred to the body. The print oil cleans the feathers and it removes ectoparasites. The feathers are extremely efficient insulators. Heat is lost from the respiratory tract by radiation and also from the featherless surfaces. You have the feet and legs of some birds like the starlings losing a substantial amount of body heat because of lack of feathers. Heat loss at night is also a probable reason why you find a bird sleeping with the beak under the wing and one leg raised. So it's a way of conserving heat. What about the skin of the amphibians? Amphibians are actually a transition between the aquatic and terrestrial vertebrates. When you take a look at the skin of the amphibians, you see that it consists of stratified epidermis and also the dermis which contains mucous and serous glands, as well as pigmented cells. The earliest forms of amphibians were covered by dermal bony scales. You have the green frog as an example of such amphibian. It's quite illustrated here. The skin of amphibians help for gaseous exchange, like the frogs and salamanders lack dermal scales. The cyclilians have dermal scales present as vestiges. The larva salamanders have the dermis composed of fibrous connective tissue. The terrestrial adult amphibians have dermis relatively thinner and divided into two layers, the stratum spongiosum and the stratum compactum. The epidermis lacks pledic cells. You also have noctal parts which are formed in the digits or limbs of the male salamander. There are also mucous and granular poison glands located in the dermis and opens in the surface through connecting ducts. Let's not forget the chromatophores which can be located in the dermis but sometimes can be in the epidermis. The capillary beds are also there and the capillary beds reach in the lower part of the epidermis for cutaneous respiration. So the capillary beds are very important for cutaneous respiration. Taking a look at the skin of reptiles, you must not forget that the reptiles are adapted to terrestrial environment compared to the amphibians. 
The skin of reptiles are thus highly keratinized. You have scutes, as can be seen in the turtles. Also, you have epidermal scales, which can be in the form of crests, spines, or horn-like surface processes. Dermal bones are also present in many reptiles. Osteoderms are also there. Osteoderm is the plate of the dermal bone located under the epidermal scale. The dermis is composed of fibrous connective tissues. Then the epidermis is divided into three layers. You have the stratum basali, stratum granulosum, and stratum corneum. You have an illustration of a snake going through egg diasis, and then also turtle and crocodile going through the same process you call egg diasis or molting. Actually, what happens is that you have periodically the skin, the stratum corneum layer of the epidermis is shed in small bits or even in a single piece in reptiles. The process is called egg diasis or molting. So illustrated here is the process as seen in the snake as well as the turtle and crocodile. So the stratum corneum is a relatively thick layer of the skin of um, the epidermis of the skin of reptiles and it's shed periodically in the process of egg diasis or molting. As talking about the skin glands, you have the femoral glands on the thigh of male lizards, then you have scent glands in crocodiles and some turtles. The scent glands open into the cloaca and on the margins of the lower jaw. Looking at the skin of mammals, mammalian skin shows notable features. You have the hair. The hair is actually an epidermal derivative. You have a variety of epidermal glands that are in the vertebrate class. The stratum corneum is very specialized, it's stratified, and you have the dermis many times thicker than the epidermis on the skin of mammals. This is very important. The skin of mammals is such that there is prevention of dehydration, and it's one evolutionary reason why mammals and some other animals are able to stay on them as terrestrial animals. You have some examples of mammals here illustrated. You have the horse and the tiger. You can see their skin covered by hair. Let's recall briefly the functions of mammalian skin. The mammalian skin serves as a barrier that helps prevent harmful microorganisms and chemicals from entering the body. It also prevents the loss of life-sustaining body fluids. The mammalian skin protects vital structures inside the body from injury and potentially damaging ultraviolet rays of the sun. The skin also helps in temperature regulation. The skin is equally important in excretion of waste products and the skin serves as a sensory organ. It has specialized nerve cells that are responsible for the sensation of touch, temperature, pressure. There are glands, epidermal glands, which are epidermal derivatives you have on the skin of mammals. You have the pseudoreferous glands or the sweat glands. Of course, this secretes sweat by the process of perspiration and is very important as far as this uh, uh, secretion of sweat is very important as far as temperature regulation is concerned. And this helps to maintain homeostasis. There are also sebaceous glands, that's the oil glands. These are connected to the hair follicles in the dermis. The sebaceous gland lubricates and protects the skin by secreting sebum. Sebum serves as a permeability barrier and also an emollient substance because it's very important as it defends the body against microorganisms and skin softening. Of course, the mammary gland is one important epidermal derivative that distinguishes mammals from other vertebrates. So that is why they are called mammals actually. Though the mammals actually have um, the sebaceous and sweat glands are also peculiar to mammals. The mammary glands are very important epidermal 
derivatives that are important in feeding the young ones. The mammary glands are actually modified apocrine sweat glands. There are other appendages you have on the skin of mammals. The hair. The hair is composed of keratin, the cells that develop from the epidermis. There are two parts of the hair. You have the shaft, which is the portion of the hair that protrudes from the skin. There is also the root, the portion of the hair embedded beneath the skin. The erector pili muscle is also an appendage that attaches to the connective tissue sheet of the hair follicle surrounding the bulb of the hair. When the erector pili muscle contracts, it pulls the follicle and its hair to erect position. This occurs in pilar erection and then you, we say you have goose bumps. Nails are also appendages. Like the hair, nails are modifications of the epidermis. They are flat honey plates on the dorsal surface of the distal segment of the digits. Nails are made up of dead cells containing the protein keratin. Nail has, each nail has three parts. You have the concealed roots, the body which is exposed but attached to the skin, and of course the edge. The nail grows out from the addition of new cells at the roots. Thank you so much for listening. Please don't forget to click the like button, the subscribe button and the notification bell. I hope to see you in the next video. Goodbye for now.